So in this video, I'd like to talk about PCR and gel electrophoresis. So here's what we're going to talk about. Um, PCR uh, is how to get a whole bunch of different, a uh, whole bunch of copies of a single DNA sequence that you want to study. Um, and gel electrophoresis is how to separate DNA fragments by, le by length. And then we'll talk about one application, um, which is using differences in DNA fragment lengths uh, to identify sexes in birds. Okay, so we can start out by um, thinking about SRY. So um, in SRY, uh, so we learned that SRY is this, the male determining gene in mammals. So um, we learned that, that this means that the organism doesn't somehow sense whether it has a whole Y chromosome or not. It's the specific protein, SRY, that's produced from the SRY gene um, that leads to uh, male specific gene regulation, right? So, so the importance here is the production of a functional copy of SRY. And so what that means is actually you can have some, S, some XY individuals that will develop as females. So if those individuals have a disabling mutation in their SRY gene, then you'll have an XY individual that does not have a intact SRY gene, so it will not make a functional SRY protein, and these in, uh, individuals will develop as phenotypically female. Um, uh, alternatively, you can have an XX individual where the SRY gene has sort of moved in the genomes, kind of a weird mutation, but it does happen, where you get a translocation, uh, um, trans, other location, um, so it go, moves to another location um, uh, of an SRY so that you can have a copy of your SRY on your X chromosome or on an autosome. So here you'd have XX individuals that would develop uh, as male. So the, the key is that to understand uh, what's going on in this key uh, sex determination gene, we need to actually look at the SRY gene. So, th so that raises the question of how is that, this done? So, so while we can generally look at a karyotype like this and say like, oh, there's an X and, X and Y, if we actually want to study the SRY gene, we're not looking at this whole Y chromosome. We're looking at a tiny little dot in the SRY. So out of all these chromosomes, all this DRNA, D DNA, we need to look at a single gene. And, and not only here, but in many cases in molecular biology, we need to look at an individual gene. So how do we do this? So we can do this by using the PCR reaction. Um, so PCR replicates DNA. So, so we're going to use polymerase to replicate DNA. Um, and so we went out through this a bit more in class and had a um, an alternative video. We, had, we went through the um, animation together, but I'm going to do it a little bit here. So we start with this surprising secret uh, that polymerase cannot initiate a strand, so it can only extend a strand. So um, that means that, so if we want to, let's say we want to replicate uh, this sequence. So, so here I'm showing the left side and the right side, and maybe there's a whole bunch of sequence in here, um, but we want to just replicate from here and replicate from there. Um, so what, what we said then is if we give it a double-stranded DNA, all these different chromosomes, um, and we put it with polymerase, nothing will happen. However, if we give it primers, these little bits of DNA um, that we manufacture, um, then it will extend. And so it'll extend one nucleotide at a time until we have a whole DNA. And as we learned in class, we can then separate again and then add the primers again. So now the primers are in blue. The red is the, is the new DNA that we've synthesized. And the black is the DNA that was in our initial sample. Um, and we synthesize, and over time, what we'll end up with is we're going to get a bunch of DNA that is of the same length. So we go from one to two to four to eight, and so uh, with 20 to 30 rounds, we can get a billion to a, mil uh, a million to a billion copies uh, for each individual copy that we started with. And so that basically ends up looking like this, um, and we end up with, um, over time, we get many cycles. Um, after many cycles, we get many copies of our DNA of interest. Um, so then the question is, how do we get it away uh, from the, the other DNA? So we have all our copies here, but we still have many chromosomes, which amounts to a huge amount of DNA. Um, and so we can ask, how are our gene copies different from the others? So, sorry, if we were in class, we could pair share on this. Um, and so a main, a main way is length, right? So here in our, um, in our test tube, we have a whole bunch of different chromosomes, which are hundreds of millions of nucleotides long. And then we have our little DNA, which might be a thousand or a few thousand nucleotides in length. So that's PCR. So now we can learn how to separate. Um, so we can do this by gel electrophoresis. So this is a method by which we can separate DNA molecules by size. And so this sort of says this over here. I'm just going to say it in my own words. 
So we have our gel here, our little slab of gel, and these, these little dots represent that this gel, um, is, it has pores, basically, so it's, um, it, it's not, the DNA can't just flow through it, it, has, it needs to sort of bump around and get through uh, this gel. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put our initial DNA sample, which has all our, uh, uh, the copies of our DNA of interest, as well as all our chromos chromosomes, just our whole DNA sample in the top. And then we're going to put it in an electrical field. We're going to put our anode, our positive source down here, and a cathode, our negative source, up here. And because DNA is negatively charged, it's going to migrate. But it migrates at different rates. So longer molecules are going to have trouble getting through this matrix. And shorter molecules, as you can see here, are going to go faster. And so that means that this is going to segregate our DNA pretty well by length. And so that means that we will have, um, we can just then pick out, uh, we know how long our DNA of interest should be, and we can grab that out. And now we've purified our short DNAs away from all our primers, our really short pieces of DNA, and away from all our chromosomes, our really long ones. Um, and so I just thought we'd do one example here with SRY. So um, Swire syndrome is a syndrome uh, that I discussed, actually, where we have individuals that are uh, XY karyotypically, uh, but that show female uh, sexual characteristics. Um, and so this is actually a record from GenBank. So NCBI is National Center for uh, Biotechnology Information in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, where all this information is kept. Uh, and so here um, we're looking, this is a sequence that is in that database. And so I just thought I'd show you basically what one of these sequences look like, because this sequence was produced by PCR. Um, and so uh, that would mean if we wanted to S uh, PCR up the whole SRY gene, that we would design primers um, to the two strands. So we'd have one pointing inward that would be complementary to this strand, and another pointing in inward from the left that would be complementary to this strand. Um, and then once we PCR it up, we would get millions of copies of basically here to there, our, our whole gene of interest. Um, so this says Homo sapiens uh, Indian Swire syndrome uh, patient. I don't, I'm not actually sure what Indian is doing here. I don't I, I quite understand that. Um, so it's a mutant of the SRY gene, and that says partial coding sequence. So actually here they didn't do the whole gene. They only did a little part that they had reason to think might have a mutation. And then it tells us, so this is just a random name for it, um, Homo sapiens, this tells us our, that we're eukaryotes, we're animals, we're chordates, we're cr uh, craniata, we're vertebrates, and so forth. Um, and this, then this tells about the paper that reported this sequence. This is the publication that reported it. Um, and then this here tells us a little about it. And so we can look and we see actually that it's actually told us what the PCR primers are the forward sequence and the reverse sequence. And I've cut it off here, but if we actually look down below, it would actually show us the sequence. Okay, so that's an example. This is example, one example of many, many examples. PCR is absolutely ubiquitous if you want to study any kind of DNA. And we'll also learn in our next video, or I'm not sure what order they'll be in, another video um, about how we need PCR in order to do transgenics. Um, but I wanted to go with one elegant example um, that I think is really good for learning PCR, and that's the case of sex determination in birds. So here we have a mating pair, male and female, mating pair, male and female, and you can see that they look quite similar in some species, and birds do not have external genitalia, so if you're studying birds, um, it can be difficult to distinguish males from females. So... As we learned, um, if you look at karyotypes in birds, uh, what you find is that in females, there's this one big extra chromosome. This isn't as clear as it is sometimes, so don't worry too much. Um, uh, sorry, not th that in birds, you see unpaired chromosomes, uh, a W and Z, and paired chromosomes in male. Um, and this, this basically was an early paper, 1966, showing that karyotypes of nine birds all show this pattern. This seems to be general across birds. Um, and so it turns out that we can use this fact that, that across birds, um, uh, that males are ZZ and females are ZW, uh, we can use that to determine the sex of some bird that we've caught. Um, and so here's the region that we're going to use to do this. Okay, so let's back up and show what we're, what, what, what we're looking at here. So sequence alignment is this, this is a sequence alignment. And it's in general, it's a way to compare two similar sequences. 
Um, and so uh, what we're looking at here is one sequence that's on the W chromosome and one that's on the Z. So it turns out to be the case that the W chromosome and the Z chromosome both have very similar copies of this gene. So you can see here that along the top, they're pretty much identical. And this gene is called CHD. We're not going to worry about what its function is. Uh, but the key point is that there's a copy of CD CHD on the W and a copy of CHD on the Z. OK, so what we're looking at here, we see all these triplets of lines. So let's figure out what each one means. So each triplet of lines, the top line is a sequence from the W. Uh, and then the next line is a sequence from the, the Z. And then the next line sort of gives us a sense of um, the level I identity. So if they're, they're identical, then there'll be an asterisk. So on this top line, all 60 nucleotides are identical. And so you see that we see star, 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 star. But on the next line, what you see is that, so the W starts A-A-G-A-A-A, -A -A -A, the Z starts A-A-G-A-G-A. -A -A -A. So at this site, there's no asterisk, right? So there, whenever there's, they're identical, there's an asterisk. When they're not identical, there's no asterisk. That's all that's going on in this third line. And then what's the relationship of these three lines to these three lines? Well, basically, these three lines are just an extension of those three lines. The problem is that if we wrote the whole sequence, the whole 652 nucleotides, if we wrote the whole sequence from here down to there, it would go off the screen. So all we've done is that when we get to here base 60, we've wrapped it around. So the W sequence goes T, C, T, C, T, A, 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 G, A, A, T, 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 G. The Z sequence goes T, C, T, C, T, A, 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 G, A, G, A, T, T, G, A, A, T and so forth. Okay, so that's all that's going on here. We've taken one long sequence alignment and we've wrapped it around. Let me say one more thing about this. Uh, this is kind of confusing because when we uh, are accustomed to seeing two sequences on top of each other, obviously, the, uh, sorry, often this will be uh, the two strands of a single DNA sequence. Um, and so, but, but if, we, if we look at it, we can see that that's not true because if this were an A and this were a complementary DNA, this would have to be a T. If this were a T, this would have to be an A, sorry. Uh, so the fact that these are not complementary to each other, but instead almost identical, uh, makes us confident that what we're looking at here is an alignment between similar sequences. OK, so this is our alignment between the, the, to the, the copy of this gene that's on the W and the copy of the gene that's on the Z. And so then I'd ask you to just stop for a second and say, what do you notice? And so probably what some of you are noticing is that there are these funny dashes here. I mean, you can notice a bunch of things, that it's mostly similar, but then there are places where it's different. But then these, there's these funny dashes. Well, what those dashes mean, let's see what would be the best place to show this. Um, well, let's look at just these two dashes here. So what you can see is that the Z and the Y, the Z and the W copies um, have almost identical sequence here, and they have almost identical sequence here. But when we look between, we have this TG on the Z that doesn't have any corresponding nucleotides on the W. So it's basically this T in the G is like a little insertion relative to the W. So what that means is that since these two genes diverged um, a long time ago, that either the W has lost a couple of nucleotides or the Z has gained a couple of nucleotides. OK, so, in, in, so we see that there, but that down here we see actually much larger gaps in it. So the way that we can use um, PCR and the fact that we have this W and Z difference um, to, to figure out sex in birds is as follows. Okay, So what we're going to do is we're going to get a pair of PCR primers, one to this conserved region. So we'll use the sequence ATC, CCAG, TG. Anyway, a sequence complementary to here. Um, on the W, and then a sequence complementary to this conserved region on, um, I'm sorry, I should have said, uh, a region conserved to the, uh, a region, we're going to design a primer to this conserved WZ region here, and then a second primer to this conserved WZ region here. And so that means that when we, um, when we uh, perform PCR, that so we'll start with this primer, and then we're going to add nucleotides. So on the W copy, we'd add all these nucleotides, and then we'd add all these nucleotides, and then we'd add all these nucleotides. And then in the opposite direction, we would be adding the complementary nucleotides uh, one at a time. 
Okay, so let's think about what, what's going to happen there. Okay, so we're going to start with primer 1. So we'll just start with this, and then we're going to add nucleotides one at a time. So that means we're adding all these, 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 um, till we get to primer 2. Um, and so that means, uh, and then when, in, in the same time, we'll be going back in the, the other direction. So overall, we're going to um, end up with a DNA. We're going to end up with a DNA um, over time that is the length um, from here to there on the W. And so actually we can see it's about 430 nucleotides. Okay, this is nucleotide 462. So here we're around 430. So the distance from here to there is about 430 nucleotides on the W. Well, what about on the Z? Okay, well, on the Z, when the Z is amplified, We'll also start here and we'll add nucleotides. We add, we add, we add, we add, we add, we add, we add. This is going to be a little bit longer, right? Because we've got all this sequence here where the Z has sequence and the W does not have sequence. So that means to get to the primer, we're going to have to go further. There's like more nucleotides between our primers on the Z. Okay, so that means that on the Z copy, uh, we'll get about 630 nucleotides. Now remember, we show these things next to each other, but actually they're, they're separate in the cell. And the, Z, the W is double-stranded, and the Z is double-stranded. So that means whenever there's a w, uh, a w chromosome, that when we use these two primers to amplify, we're going to get a band. A, we're we're going to get a bunch of, nucle of DNA sequences uh, that will be around 430 nucleotides, that is, between this primer and that primer on the W sequence. And when we do, do it with the Z sequence, um, we're going to go all the way from here to there. Um, which is about 630 nucleotides on the Z sequence. And the difference is due to the fact that between the sequence, this conserved sequence, and this conserved sequence, we have all this extra stuff. Okay, so, so, so now let's think about how, what we can do. So we have these two techniques, PCR and gel electrophoresis. I've said if we use these primers, that we'll get these different sequences. And they have different lengths. So what that means is that we can actually use gel electrophoresis um, to... Uh, try to distinguish between male and female birds. And so what we're looking at here, so these are different samples from different birds, that they're from, some are from blood, some are from muscle, some are from, from feather. And so what we see are these different bands here. Right? So what does this mean? Well, we said that the Z, um, when we use this PCR, that the Z is going to give us a band around 630 nucleotides. Um, and that the W is going to give us a band around 430 nucleotides. Um, and so the Z one, so, so if an individual has a Z chromosome and another Z chromosome, then we would expect to get a whole bunch of nucleotides that are, a, a whole bunch of DNAs that are 630 nucleotides. So that means when we run this out on a gel and we separate it by length, that we'd expect to see one band that would be both Z chromosomes, all, everything that was amplified on that Z. However, if the individual has a Z and a W, well, the Z should amplify at about 630 nucleotides, and the W should, should amplify 430 nucleotides, which is going to run faster down the, the gel. So we're going to get the top band, so that means that this top band, these are all Zs, and the bottom band, those are all Ws. And so what that means is that we can just look at a lane, and we can say, okay, this one has one high band, so this is a ZZ individual, so this individual must be a male. This one's a little bit messy, let's leave it aside. Uh, this one has one band that's ZZ, so that must be a male. Um, this one seems to have one big uh, Z band, so that must be a male. But this one has two bands, the top band, which, which must be the Z, and a bottom band, which must be the ZW. So this must be a ZW female. This one must be a ZW female. This Z band is faint, we might want to re rerun it, but it looks like it's a ZW, a Z, ZW, and so forth. And so we can use this um, to determine which ones are males and which ones are, are females. And this is actually, um, this is the kind of work that's done in the Seagull lab. This is Rabinder Seagull and his, his team from a few years ago. So these are all San Francisco State students um, or former students. Um, and they use this technique in the lab to study avian, avian parasitology. Okay, so, so I said that um, with these primers, I've changed them to arrows just to make our exercise clearer. That if we have a primer here and we have a primer here, that this will work because it, it will amplify and it will give us different lengths. So now I want to ask, what about other positions? 
So what if we used um, this conserved sequence and that conserved sequence? So if we did that, would this allow us to distinguish males and females? So if you think about it, it wouldn't, because if you look at the sequence that's in between, it's pretty much identical. It's the same length. So that would mean that if we use these paired primers from the W, we would amplify about 70 nucleotides. From the Z, we would amplify about 70 nucleotides. It would work, but when we ran it on a gel, males and females would look the same. They both have a single band that would be 70 nucleotides. Well, what if we use, um, like, let's say we use this region, and let's say we designed a primer to the W sequence, the top sequence. Well, how would that work? Well, if we think about it, what would happen is um, because the sequences are different here, if we used a primer that was complementary to the W sequence, um, this would amplify when we had a W chromosome. So we would see something in uh, females, but it would not amplify off the Z. So we wouldn't see anything when we did males. So that might sound like it's good because we would see the W but not see the, the Z. The only problem there is if we go back to our, to our method here, what we see is that we have some lanes where, for some reason, nothing amplifies. So the problem is, is if we had, under this circumstance, if we were doing it to the, the W um, sequence, so then the Z, um, if we had a ZZ individual, we wouldn't expect any amplification. And so then, uh, for ZZs, we'd expect to see an empty lane. But if you see an empty lane, then you wouldn't know, well, did my reaction not work? Did something go wrong with my experiment? Or is this a ZZ individual? So that wouldn't be great because we wouldn't be able to, we, we really want to amplify both sequences so we, so we have a positive result. Yes, this individual only has Zs, not Ws. Yes, this individual has both a Z and a W. Okay, so our summary here, um, uh, we can use PCR to amplify a target region or sequence. Gel electrophoresis is a method by which we can separate sequences based on length. Um, so we can separate our PCR product from other DNAs. Um, and then we, we learned how to use PCR to test the sex of birds.